just to set the expectations for tonight, we're not going to change the world. Uh, everyone here is going to wake up in the same dysfunctional, broken world tomorrow morning that we woke up into today. But we do hope that maybe in a small way uh, we can try to change something and change a little bit of our life as we go forward. Uh, the genesis for this program was actually, uh, as we watched over the course of last summer, a lot of people shouting at each other about their opinion versus someone else's opinion, trying to outshout them in terms of whose opinion was right and whose opinion was wrong. And I've always found that you really don't convince people by shouting. I feel that you can convince people through reason and, and conversation. So that's what we're going to, to try to accomplish on anything like this. On the walls of the police building are, are, are the principal, are pillars of character for the division of police. Trustworthiness, respect, responsibility, fairness, caring, and citizenship. And by hosting this event tonight, the Springboro Police are hoping that we're fulfilling our pillar of citizenship because we feel it's just important to try to be part of the initiative to get this going. Obviously, affecting change in our country is like turning a large ship. It's done very small ways, very incremental ways. And sometimes it takes generations to change the direction in which our country is going or the dialogue that's currently going underway in our country. But hopefully, for people all around our country who are taking the time to sit and listen to each other, talk to each other, put their feelings, thoughts, and perceptions out there, uh, hopefully a lot of opportunities to, uh, I'm going to take this off here, um, to uh, kind of maybe move the needle forward just a little bit because we all are trying to get to a more perfect union. Everybody sees life through the collective experiences, a lens that is based on the collective experiences of your life. And we all have a natural tendency to view the way we look at the world as being superior. That's just natural. But in reality, when you start talking to other people who were born in different countries, were born in different states, were born with different experiences, we find that we just have a little different lens on everybody in the world. And that doesn't make your lens right or wrong, it just makes those lens different. And that applies to everybody. Um, we, we all want to hold on to that, but um, our goal here tonight is to let everybody take a moment to see how we interact with each other and maybe uh, start some conversations that uh, are in your circle of influence that you have. Uh, just as an example, my wife and I last Saturday had a couple over to the house to play cards. And we've known this couple for many, many, many years. And we played cards with them many, many times. But just in anticipation of this event, the conversation turned to how, what we think about bias and about race and about prejudice. And we had a pretty robust conversation about that. And we had never had that conversation before. So I think it's important if we challenge ourselves to have these kinds of conversations, some of them may be uncomfortable, in our own little circle of influence, I think we can affect that change. So I'm joined here tonight by four friends of mine, and I appreciate them taking the time. First, we have Jerry Ferris, and then we have Reverend Alan Foster, and then we have R.D. Caldwell, and we have Terry Harden. And I appreciate if you want to give them a little round for being here and putting themselves on the hot seat, if you will. Uh, Jerry, I'd like to start with you. 40-year um, resident of Springboro, a Marine, proud Marine. Um, and Darlene, I, I don't know how you let him out of the house with that uniform. He's a good-looking guy with that uniform on. I, I was on uh, a 9-11 service where he showed up in his dress blue uniform. And maybe, Jerry, you can tell us what some of those medals that you had were uh, on were. And... Um, it, you, your, your father was a police officer, uh, then he became in charge of the Equal Opportunity Commission and dealt with issues of civil rights way before most of us probably knew what civil rights were. And uh, is currently the commissioner of the Warren County Veterans Affairs. So tell us a little bit, if you will, about what your job entails nowadays and, and what the Veterans Commission does. Thank you. All right. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say uh, uh, thank you, uh, Chief Cridoff, for allow me to be a part of this, uh, this panel this evening. And as I look out, I want to say thank you to all the uh, people that have come out to listen to us uh, this evening. It's an honor and a pleasure for me to be here. So I want to thank you for doing the hard work in putting this thing together, Chief. When I talk about 
growing up in Cincinnati and as a kid, and my dad was a real influence. Now, my dad was a trash collector. He started out tra uh, collecting trash. And back then, they wouldn't even let the black guys drive the truck. It was like they had to, they were on the back throwing the trash. And that went on for a long time. But while my dad was doing that, he found a way to get into college. And he went into uh, uh, the, the, uh, Central State University, and he went to uh, Central, uh, uh, Howard, not Howard, but uh, uh, what's the other one up here in it's Wilberforce? Yeah, he went to Wilberforce. And while he was doing that, he had, he had a goal. He had a mission. And that's one of the things that he taught me. He says, Jerry, you've got to think about what you want to do. You've got to plan how you're going to make it. And it's going to be difficult because you're a black man. And of course, being young, you know, we saw some things where the white kids would play on one side and the black kids on the other side. But we never kind of got together for anything. But as we got older, then we started to understand and started to realize what racism really was. But long story short, my dad uh, graduated from college and he went to the police academy. And while he was at the police academy in Cincinnati, he was one of three black African-American police officers in Cincinnati at that time. And we're talking about in the 50s. And so with that being said, it was a pleasure, but yet it was a curse. Because my dad being a cop, I wasn't allowed to do anything. I couldn't go anywhere, couldn't have fun, couldn't do what the other kids did because all the police officers knew my dad. And if I got in trouble, they knew who to talk to. But as he was going through, through that, he spent, he spent about seven years in the police department and things started to change in America. The civil rights, how do blacks interact with whites? What do the jobs look like? How do things unfold relative to employment, education, et cetera? And so during his time at the, uh, after he left the police department, he got into the Civil Rights Commission and he did a lot of work on trying to help African Americans achieve equality in the workplace. It wasn't long before he was promoted and he was, he was tapped to, be, to become the director of the EEOC in uh, uh, the state of Ohio. And with that being said, I think a lot of people who live close here in Springboro or, or around know where Armco Steel is, now called AK Steel. Well, my dad sued Armco for $6 million. And that suit was because they were trying to achieve equality in pay for the African Americans that worked out in the mill. And so William Verity, and at that time, Armco Steel Company was a privately owned company and at that time, the, the African-American workers were making way less than the white workers in doing the same job, side by side, but not making the, the, the amount. So what they did, they ended up settling. And my dad didn't want them to settle because there was a lot more they could get. The problem was is that when they settled, when they, they, sent, they, 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 they made a settlement, and they didn't allow the appeal to go through. So what happened is Armco sent all these checks out to all these African Americans. And most of them had never seen that amount of money on one check at one time, so they all cashed them. So that ended the suit. Part of that situation was that I had already been to, to the service and back. But when I got back, I was looking for a job. And my dad had opened the door for me to be, uh, to go into Armco Steel Company in Middletown, Ohio. And I was the first African American to walk in that office and work at headquarters department as an order entry clerk. I was not welcome with open arms, but my dad told me, he says, look, he says, I've opened the door for you, but now you've got to do the work. 
And most of us are going to tell you that it took us a while to understand that we have to do better. We have to work harder in order to be equal. Long story short, and I'm going to cut this short a little bit because I know you want to get around to the other guys. The thing is, is that it's conversation. When I got in there, the first day, first day, I had three people come up to me and told me, says, the only reason you're here is because you're black and you're a number. So stay out of my way. Now, I could have reacted two different ways. Coming from Vietnam, I could have punched the lights out. Where would I be? But listening to them, I was not going to stoop to that level. So it's how you react or how I reacted when I was going through this. I said, okay, what it does to me is it points you out and it lets me know where you're coming from. Ultimately, in 26 years that I spent at Armco Steel Company, those three guys became some of my best friends. My wife even knows one of them, uh, Mitch Enright, who ended up baking bread for us and coming to the apartment that we lived in. But the thing is, is that because I was there and I was, I was not going to allow anybody to dictate who I am or what I was going to be, they had to get to know me. But I worked everybody. And as my career ended, I got promoted from there, went through all the departments at general office, was a sales office supervisor, moved from there to an outside sales rep and was one of the best sales reps they had up until my retirement. So with that being said. Well tell us a little bit about this Veterans Affairs because I'm intrigued by someone who gets to order the mayor around as the executive director of Veterans <laughs> Affairs. Uh, tell us a little bit about what your job is there now. Let me tell you this, a lot of, a lot of you know uh, Mayor John Agenbro has been the mayor of Springboro for a hundred years. Okay? <laughs> now, the, the thing about the mayor is a great friend. It's, a, it's another story that really kind of holds us together right now. And that is that he was a coach for a football team. And my son, who graduated in 1994, was one of his players on the Springboro football team. And I didn't know the mayor. I knew him as a coach, but I wasn't familiar with who the mayor was. And being a photographer, I was down on the field, and we got to talk, and I heard him talking to somebody, and they found out that he was a Marine. And so I had to go up to him and say, hey, I understand that you're a Marine. He said, yeah. I said, well, I'm a Marine. I said, well, I served in Vietnam. He said, I served in Vietnam. I said, well, I got, I missed a class on Duckett, and I got three Purple Hearts. He said, well, I got three Purple Hearts. I said, who did you serve with? He said, 1st Battalion or 1st Division, Lima Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, Lima 3-5. The mayor and I served at the same time, the same division, same battalion, and we never knew each other until my son was a football player for him. But now, what was going on, being a commissioner in Warren County, we take care of the veterans. And what we do is we provide several different aspects of relief and support for all of our veterans, whether they're just now getting out or whether they've been out for a while. We've got a transportation department. I think we've got, what, 15 drivers and 15 vans. You've probably seen the Warren County Veterans Service uh, vans running around the city. They pick up past, uh, veterans and take them to and from their doctor appointments and the widows of doctor, for, for doctor's appointments, et cetera. We've got our emergency financial relief. If you come up on hard times and you're a veteran, come down and take a look at what we can do for you. Bring your DD-214 and we can find a way to help you get through the hard times. We've got service officers or what we call VSOs and those VSOs are skilled, knowledgeable about veteran benefits. And they can help you file a claim, uh, get medical benefits, and get compensation for any injuries suffered either while you were in the service or uh, in combat, et cetera. So the story that the chief is talking about is I told the mayor, I said, John, when I come to the city building, you're the boss. I said, well, when you come down here to Warren County Veterans Service Office, I'm the boss. <laughs> okay. 
Thank you both for your service. <coughs> Alan, uh, born in rural Georgia, sent by your parents to Southwest Ohio as a young man, and we're going to get into that story a little bit why that happened, but currently you run Grace Ministries, which you kind of described as a church without walls, and I find that interesting because I see a lot of, because of COVID, a lot of churches are trying to get outside their four walls. So tell us a little bit about Grace Ministries and, and what that involves. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank God for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for thinking enough of me to invite me and pastor and to you who are here tonight. Uh, I am the president, CEO in charge of Grace Ministries. Grace Ministries is a ministry that deals with holistically the needs of people. And when I say people, we believe that we are led to serve those who come in our path. The Bible teaches us, Jesus said, when I was hungry, you fed me. Naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you visited me. So we do all those things based on the need that come our way. We deal in Pacific areas, you know, um, there are major crises of single families in the African-American communities. We mentor and teach the importance of, first of all, uh, following Christ that would allow you to uh, be humble and, and, and become ultimately successful. We stress on a high level education uh, the way out of poverty, the greatest way, the best way is education. We do a lot of mentoring. We provide one-on-one -on -one mentorship as often as possible. But our greatest effort that a lot of people don't realize how many people struggle just this basic of having something to eat. So once a week we are partnering with the Life Enrichment Center in Dayton, where we literally have a truckload of food of various kinds. We take it out to our farms and we, we divide it up into groups who, and then take and support as many families as possible. We have about seven, as we refer to them as distributors. They serve at least anywhere from five to 10 families. Uh, we often have seniors who are unable to, uh, we found a lot of time there are a lot of seniors who don't qualify for a lot of services. They have met, may have been former teachers or, or a pretty decent employment situation where they don't qualify for a lot of benefits such as, such as food stamps. So we provide warm hot cooked meals uh, that's delivered. Uh, now we don't do it as much because of COVID but we uh, simply uh, prepare it, give them a call, take it to the residence, sit it down, and take off. That's basically as uh, needed. And then uh, again, once a week, uh, we kind of alter. If you're in our program, normally when we make a delivery, it would normally last about three weeks. So we have certain ones that receive meals uh, this week, it may be three weeks or two weeks before they receive others, and that is in order that we will be able to meet the need of all those that um, come in contact with us. It is strictly, we, we are not a uh, 501c3, we're strictly a faith ministry. Uh, we don't accept donations or anything from anybody that expects uh, you know, with grants and all these things, you can spend more time documenting and, and, and reporting and those type of things. So we want to be beholden to God only. So we strictly go out of our pockets. Uh, our ministry uh, consists of my uh, son and his family who lives in Columbus make financial contributions, my wife and my daughter and myself. Uh, we call us the Magnificent Seven. That is the foundation uh, of this uh, ministry. And, and, and again, we have never, since 2001, 
There have never been a case, and this is a confirm in our minds that God is with us. We have never had to say no. If someone called tonight and said, I need some food, we can be there within an hour uh, with nutritious, I have a farm, uh, I'm uh, from Georgia, as Chief mentioned, can't get farming out of my system <laughs> for the simple reason is that we grew our food, we grow healthy vegetables. Um, just for an example, on New Year's Day, we had a, the traditional New Year's meal, which everything we consume came from the farm. We have uh, vegetables that has been uh, preserved for the purpose of uh, cooking meals. We have beef and pork and goat. Uh, we raise goats and we, uh, and to a lot of people, I see some people smiling. Uh, but if you don't have much money, it's hard to survive going to Kroger. So we just uh, enjoy uh, providing meals through uh, the process of growing. We also have families, and we are increasing the number. We have families going to come out and literally be given an area that they can grow vegetables. There's a lot of learning to be done in uh, planting a tomato seed, a little small seed. For children to see that seed turn into many of tomatoes, we are increasing that service. We found a lady that's able to teach how to preserve. She said to us, anything that we can grow, she can teach families how to preserve it. So therefore, it's it supplement the food uh, uh, price tag, but it's also in this time of uh, obesity, uh, we can teach healthy eating and. Um, it's just a lot of uh, joy, and, and when you find so the saying, the saying says that if you find something that you love to do is not work, and gardening and and growing animals is is a tremendous labor intense, but I enjoy every minute because I know every time uh, and everything I do at the end of the day, not only will my family benefit, but someone else. Will benefit, and I'll close by saying, as Martin Luther King said, the way a judge man is how much he's willing to do for somebody else, there and that's the uh, process we take at Grace Ministries. And there you go. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Next, R.D. Mr. Supernatural Universe, uh, born a sports athlete in Troutwood. Parents are here. I've lived here. I've lived in Springboro for over 20 years. Uh, personal trainer. You spend a lot of times with the ministry, both with uh, juveniles and adults who have found themselves kind of awry in our correction system. <clears throat> I met R.D. a couple of years ago at a very similar thing in a church in West Dayton. Uh, was that after the Ferguson-Michael Brown killing that uh, they held that meeting? It was in a church, a lot of concerns raised. And I met R.D. at that church, was introduced to him by the police chief in uh, Germantown who happened to be coach of uh, R.D. in football. And um, I was really impressed with him. You talk about uh, still waters run deep. This is a quiet man who goes about his business and um, his sport, his occupation as a personal trainer, and his passion for ministering to people. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, what you have going on in your life with the ministry and uh, where you are competitively, if you want to get into that. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Chief. <clears throat> so the prison ministry is basically because of the fact that, as we all should know, statistically, there is an unbalanced number of black males that are incarcerated. So one of the goals of the prison ministry is to be an advocate for Jesus Christ and to go in and spread the good news of the gospel. But I also am a part of uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base mentorship program, their Boys to Men program, because I want to have a positive influence in stopping the school to prison pipeline. You all would be enamored and in, in, in shock by the number of black kids that I meet that are illiterate, that are in junior high school, or that are in high school, and they cannot read, because unfortunately they've been pushed through the system. So if I can have a positive influence, if I can make a change, that will be my goal, to keep them out of prison 
So as we all know, prevention is the best medicine. So I'm making an attempt in every effort that I can to step in in any way, shape, or form and to try to bring a stop to the negative influences of, of the media and the music, which we don't control, and these images to keep the kids in school and out of the streets and to keep them out of the prison system and out of the vicious, vicious cycle of going into jail, being incarcerated, and then getting stuck in that system and that vicious cycle. So that's just one of my goals and one of the things that we do with Hustling for Jesus Prison Ministry. And it's a concept of we're all hustling for something, but the goal is to hustle for Jesus Christ and translate souls out of darkness into the kingdom of light. Good. Thanks so much. In your uh, profession, uh, I don't know if any of you know a lot about Tom Brady. We're going to see a little bit of him on Sunday. But one thing that always impressed me about Tom Brady was he could tell you today what he's going to eat on May 13 or 15 or pick a date six months out and he can tell you what he's eating. I, RD with his discipline and his sport is uh, kind of built that same way. And uh, Tell us a little bit about the discipline it took to get to, to Mr. Natural Universe and what your day does, uh, what, what that involves. Well, I'd like to acknowledge my parents who are in the audience and I have to give them credit for the way that they raised me and my father for being so strict on me <laughs> which allowed me to attain a higher level of discipline so in the craft of bodybuilding it's all about you present your body on a stage during a competition and we're judged on symmetry, proportion, balance, overall conditioning, muscularity so in order to achieve that I have to eat a certain way. You know, I can't eat whatever I want. I have to eat what works for my body. I have to look at food as fuel, and that's it. So I don't eat for taste. I eat for what it does for my body. And glory to God, I've had the ability to attain professional status naturally. And unfortunately, in bodybuilding, um, performance-enhancing drugs are very rampant, and they don't hide their head in the sand about it. It's a well-known fact that the majority of the professional competitors are using some form of steroids, growth hormone, insulin, diuretics, and the list goes on. So because at an early age, I made a promise to myself, to God, and to my family to not only not ever use steroids, but no drugs. So I've never consumed, I've never tasted alcohol, and I've never smoked either. Um, so I pretty much eat the same thing every day. A very strict regimen. I prepare all my foods. I can't remember the last time I had any fast food or any things of that nature. And um, unfortunately, well, I'll stick to the topic at hand. Unfortunately, I was in a federation that I'm no longer associated with at all, and I won't say their name because I don't want to give them any attention. But the black competitors will win all of the shows. Overall, majority of the time, the black competitors will win but we would never get any magazine coverage. And it was an interesting thing because I didn't know that initially, but I found out that was kind of well known within that particular federation that even if you win, you're not gonna get, a, get on a magazine. And it was just one of those things, and it, it was very discouraging because you put in all this work, you make these sacrifices, you go to bed at a certain time, you get up at a certain time, and then you win the competition, but you don't receive any type of coverage for all the hard work that you put in to achieve that victory. So, and this is still current to this day. So unfortunately, you know, to be able to, to say something like that is kind of a sad fact. Yeah, I want to come back to that in a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to take a time to introduce our fourth person, uh, Terry Harden. I've probably known the longest of any of the gentlemen up here. Terry and I have been seeing each other once a week for, I don't know, six years or so, Terry? Um, At least. Or so. Um, and uh, I have to say this man is more knowledgeable about the Bible. I don't mean to disparage you, Roger, but he is one smart guy when it comes to the Bible. So, um, uh, Athlete in school, tremendous athlete in school growing up. Had a career in pharmaceutical research and is now the chaplain for the West Carrollton Police Department. And tell us a little bit about what a chaplain for a police department does. Well, a chaplain for a police department does everything. He's a servant. I'm there to serve the, not only the police department, but the whole department. 
I serve the city on behalf of the department. Um, I do everything from, well, whatever I'm called to do, but we're there for the um, officers, we're there for their families, we're there for the community, we're there for moral support, we're there for spiritual support, we're there at times just to be someone that's there to provide a presence, to provide encouragement, to provide an, an incentive. Um, for me, it's pretty much um, just letting them know how much I appreciate the sacrifice that they make on a daily basis. I think many of us take for granted so many things within our daily, um, our, our daily motion and activities that we never think about the sacrifices of the men and women in blue and how they make a conscious decision daily, hourly, to see to it that we can do what we do with a sense of protection, ease, and without being burdensome because they're in the trenches kind of doing whatever they need to do to stop the bad guys. And so as a chaplain, my primary um, responsibility is to be available, to be visible, to be teachable, to maintain a 24-hour prayer vigilance over them, over their family, over the city, over the state, and to just represent my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in any and every way that I can to let them know that someone cares. The police profession, Terry, is many times the, the lightning rod for issues of systemic racism, and it's many times a police incident that causes these, these uh, communities to, to boil over. Why is a as a black man, would you go into a police department? You could go into prisons. You could go into what? What led you to say, "I'm going to put myself at ground zero for a lot of these issues going on in our society"? Well, the, the opportunity presented itself to me. I had been associated with the West Carolina Police Department. I can't remember how many years now. My, my chief is here, Chief acknowledging you. Um, I know in 2008, my daughter and I went through the Citizen uh, Police Academy there in West Carrollton. And prior to that, for about at least three years prior, I had met a detective there, a very well-known detective. And he and I had developed a conversation. A lady in the church had told me that he was a Christian police officer. And so we developed a relationship, and he told me that they had a Bible study and invited me there. And so I became a part. And I, again, it's been at least since probably 2005, if not earlier. And as a result of just being there, the camaraderie, uh, the opportunity presented itself in uh, 2018 for me to become a chaplain. And so for me, it was just a matter of being able to be a presence. I, in my earlier years, didn't know much about police officers. I didn't revere them as much as I feared them because of the way I was brought up in the community in which I was brought in and the reputation officers had, as well as not really knowing any police officers personally and knowing the men and the women of the West Carrollton Police Department has been a, just a tremendous privilege and opportunity because what it has done is it has allowed me to truly understand what sacrifice is. It has allowed me to truly understand that it's not a matter of color because we, as men, we put on our pants the same way we love the same things, we have the same goals, we have the same desires, but it's just that they have chosen 
to be a part of a profession that in our community wasn't, didn't have many people of color. And so as a result of being able to walk with and to serve the men and women of West Carrollton Police Department, I've learned the same lesson there that I learned while working in the hospital. And that is that in times of need, we're all the same and stripped of any privilege, of any position. We're pretty much all just the same. And that has been the privilege of my life, just to be able to walk with the men and live in it, to be able to add a voice to say that, you know, you are significant, not just to me, to my family, to my community, to my loved ones. And I can't thank them enough. Let's stay with you for a minute, Terry. Um, you talk about being an athlete and when it came time to look at college, which was kind of a foreign thing to your family, getting pushed towards trade schools and, and how you kind of got discovered to end up with a career in pharmaceutical research. Could you share that story with everyone? Well, coming out of high school, I had a number of basketball scholarships. But about my 11th grade year, going into my 11th grade year, the counselor called me in and acknowledged my accomplishments, but basically told me that he didn't think I was college material and suggested a vocational training career. I didn't know my, um, I'm one of 11 children. My parents were not educated. My father had to quit in the sixth grade to go to a place called 3C Camp to develop a trade to support his family, his brothers and sisters and his mother. And so I was not raised around um, educated people. I, uh, when I was coming up, it was the barber and the preacher pretty much were the people that wore the ties and or the white shirts. Most of them just wore jeans and bib overhauls. And so I went into vocational welding, did that for a year. After I came out, I went into a factory, was there for six months and realized that this wasn't the place for me. So I went to Wilberforce University, stayed there for a trimester, I think it was, then was able to transfer to Ohio State University. Uh, got at Ohio State University, not knowing what I wanted to do. I was a black studies major, but I got a, a student, uh, student job as a custodian. And in this particular building, I would go through the hospital and I would see um, there was a group of people that were staying after work doing packaging certain things on one day or another day. They may have been dealing with some vials or things of this nature. So I began to show myself friendly, strike up conversation. And one day I just said, hey, if you guys ever need some help, I think I can do this, give, give me a call. And that day came. They called me. And five years later, you know, I was able to um, work my way up to research associate. I was able to interact with and be involved with some of the greatest minds in the country. I was able to, if you will, kind of peek behind the curtain of the of Oz. I got a chance to, to, to deal with people that um, are involved now, and I was in uh, phase three clinical trials. And a lot of the people were from NIH, and of course the guy I worked with, or for, was an MD, PhD, and they were just cerebral. They were just intelligent people. But what I really also got an opportunity to see, not only did I experience a lot of racism, but I also got an opportunity to see that they were only human. Many of them were as frail or fragile as I was as a young teenager. Uh, second and third families, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, again, it, it was a great privilege. It was a great challenge, but it was also just an honor. I think it was just God saying, you know, you are more than what they're saying you are. And so it gave me an opportunity to make a contribution in that, uh, in that respect. Hmm, awesome. R.D., going back to you, and you kind of got into this, I, I, my, my question was going to be, we see black athletes excelling in basketball and football, and, uh, but, but, but black athletes also kind of excel in bodybuilding? 
Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, so is is there a lot of bias in that profession? Uh, we, um, I, I think I, I asked that question because I personally don't follow your sport. I don't know how many people in the audience might follow your sport, but is there a lot of bias in the, the art? We've seen, you, you mentioned one example in that certain federation, but as a sport generally, is there a lot of bias in uh, Yes, sir, I would say it still exists. Um, unfortunately, if we look at the, going back, the term race is a social construct that did not come into the world until the 1500s. So there was a, I'll speak r relatively vaguely, but there was a particular state, and I do want to give credit to the particular gentleman that took the initiative to do this. But as you stated, as I stated earlier, a lot of the black athletes, the black competitors have a tendency to win and relatively dominate in the sport. There was an all white male judging panel and I had the opportunity to meet the chairman of this particular district who is a white male. And he said, you know what? This isn't right. This is not reflecting the nature of our competitors. We literally have, there's female competitors. <laughs> this is not a good representation of the industry here that we have. So he has since retired, but he took the initiative to take me on as one of the first black judges in that area. Mm because he wanted the rep representation. So not only me, he also hired a uh, female Mexican judge to have more representation for the ladies as well. And so from there, he just continued to have a more diverse judging panel. So I would definitely want to give him credit. So I think it's more of the, the balance of representation as far as looking at power and resources going up to the top. So a lot of black athletes, but how many black owners, how many black coaches? So that same thing is reflected. A lot of black competitors, but how many black judges? Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things and one of the discrepancies that are there in the industry. You used a couple of terms when we were talking earlier. One was uh, push on and push through. But you also talked about no one was ever going to outwork you. Un unpack that a little bit in terms of your approach towards your sport, that there might be some things against me, but no one is ever going to outwork me. I'll, kinda, when did you come to that? Has that been the way you've been all your life in, the, in sports? Yes, sir. And again, I have to acknowledge my parents for that. Um, just the way that they raised me. My father knew what I would be facing as a young black mo boy living in America, fighting against the systems, systematic racism and the prejudices and the biases. And he told me when I was very young, you have to work twice as hard. So my childish comprehension, I understood that, that I could control my effort. No matter what obstacle I come up against, no matter what I face, if people try to hold me back, no matter what, I can control how much effort I put into what I do. I can control my actions. So this started to lead me in a certain way that no matter what, I have to outwork everybody. No matter what they do, and that helped me achieve the professional status naturally because you can take all the steroids that you want. It doesn't matter. You're not going to work harder than I am. And so that I can always control that because he knew what I would be facing. He knew that it would be hard. And he also educated me in certain things, just little things that a lot of people I don't think consider, like don't ever wear your hood in a store that might be small. You know, that we're, we're not supposed to judge. The Bible says we're not supposed to judge, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. But he let me know that you're going to, unfortunately, in this society, in this culture, you're going to be judged. So make sure you conduct yourself in a proper way. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic because even now, I'm, I think I'm fairly muscular. You know, I work out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's conscious when I go into stores, particularly if I'm in a majority white area, it's hot, say the summertime, it's the middle of July. I might have a tank top on in my car, but I make sure that I put a t-shirt on before I enter into the store. Now, why is this, you might ask? Because as a black male, I want to make sure that I'm not intimidating. 
because I've been followed in stores. And I've been looked at funny, like, what are you doing here? Why are you here? And it's a very, very uncomfortable feeling, but it's something that I have experienced regularly, even now in 2021. So it's just kind of an unfortunate state. But again, just to reiterate the fact that my father taught me that I have to work twice as hard and that I can control that effort. Is that message, you, you had that message all your life. Now you're meeting young men who are 12, 13, 16, 18. Is it easy to, to, to convey that same message to them to work hard and to push through? Um, or, or is it already a little too late to get them to be that and to realize the goal is achievable for me? Do, do you understand my question? It, it, you, you had it from birth, and, it, and so it became part of your personal philosophy. But now you're running into teenagers and young men who have made some mistakes in life. Mm -hmm. Is, does your message to push on and push through and no one's going to work you, does that fall on receptive ears at that age or is it already too late, I guess is my question. No, no, I don't believe it's ever too late. I believe that um, one plants, one waters, and God gives an increase. So mm -hmm. my goal is to plant seeds. I remember all of my coaches because they had an influence on my life. So even though I'm thankful that I have my father in my life and I have both of my grandfathers in my life. Unfortunately, in the black community, a lot of young black kids, boys and girls, do not, there's a lot of fatherlessness and I could go on about that and how that's come about. But I feel obligated to be a positive male role model within my community. And Glory to God for giving me this muscular physique. <laughs> because when I go into the schools, they're all intrigued, like, man, what does he have? So I have their attention immediately, as soon as I walk in. So it's very engaging, and they ask a lot of questions. So no, I don't believe that it falls on deaf ears. I believe that I am making a positive impact. If we go back to me attempting to break the vicious cycle of incarceration and becoming institutionalized, I focus more on rehabilitation with the inmates. And I've been out somewhere and some guys running up to me like, hey, hey man, I remember you came to see me when I was locked up and I'm out and I got a job and I got a place to live. So I think that message had impact on those people that I run into that are leading positive lives that have become good citizens that are not back in jail. So I definitely believe in breaking cycles, and I'm thankful that God has given me the ability to do that. I encourage everyone to Google R.D. Caldwell if you want to get an idea on how he looks physically. You're not seeing it in the suit. <clears throat> Alan, um, you talk about farming's in your blood. Tell me a little bit when you were a young man. Your dad owned a farm, but there was also a gentleman down the street who owned a farm who was white. And he needed help during harvest season. Uh, for, tell, tell the story about, he wouldn't come over and say, uh, Mr. Foster, can Alan come? Uh, unpack that story for me, because I found that pretty powerful. Well, first of all, to understand, um, I was born in 1954 in uh, rural Georgia. And this was the time when the civil rights movement began to combat or to rid itself of segregation and Jim Crow. It was extremely dangerous just to be black. And it was even more dangerous to be black and male. There was a fear of black men. And the, the fear was that I will lose my power. You know, everybody likes to have the power. And the, the resistance to Jim Crow law was made it again even doubly dangerous because of the fear of losing control. So at, those, at that time, the, the desire to control was amped up tremendously. And one of the ways of control was to make sure, I made a statement, you might, 
the, the, during that time, there was a saying that white people in the South didn't care how close you were as long as you didn't gain anything. The white people in the North didn't care how much you achieved, just didn't want you to be close. And as for the Southern white man, the white community, the Jim Crow law, was to keep you close enough so I can understand and have full knowledge that you're not gaining, you're not processing. And one of the benefits that if you were a black family, nine times out of 10, you're not gonna own anything. You're gonna be through credit or sharecropping, you're going to be totally depending upon the white man. And there's two things that could happen to you. Uh, Chief mentioned having a, uh, this neighbor, and not only him, any white person, there were 14 of us. And my dad was a hard worker and he taught us to work hard. We had to work hard, obviously, to just to survive, just to have food on the table with 14 children. You could either be lynched or cut off, or nobody would give you work, that you could not survive and take care of your family. So my father being a proud, strong man, uh, I grew up with grace and truth. My mother was soft and wonderful and sweet, and she said, baby, take it easy, follow the law. My father had the attitude that we would do everything we have to do to survive as long as your manhood is not taken uh, from a physical standpoint. So I had this particular gentleman would often come down and basically he, he, he didn't have to uh, be forceful. Just him asking was force enough. And there have been times my older brother there was force enough that my father knew that by, I had three old, older brothers. We were in pairs, the two oldest one, and I, my third brother, I was the fourth of, of uh, five boys. And one day, this was during the time, as I mentioned, when civil rights movement and Martin Luther King and Edgar Meredith and all those civil rights people were gaining process. And the white man felt especially in those areas, and you have to, in, in those areas of Georgia, you have Atlanta, Savannah, Augusta, and a few large cities, but 80% is small cities and communities with 2,000 people to left, where very few own anything. So you are totally 100% dependent on it. And one day, I can't remember exactly what the process, the progress, that black people were making through the civil rights movement. And you're talking about hate, the definition of hate is having that intense. And this guy, now mind you, I, I was uh, eight years old when the, when the four girls was uh, bombed in uh, Birmingham, uh, the Cheney, uh, and the two Jews, you know, this was part of our just regular everyday uh, hearing on the news, so and, and that was the ones that just got attention. You 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 didn't hear about the ones at different counties that was lent. But anyway, this particular day we had achieved a great success of one milestone. And this guy was when he came to me, I, I was known for being able to drive a tractor. When the harvest, when the crops is finished, you have to turn the land over. And he had come to get me to do that, and I was out in the field, and I could see him coming, and I could tell the way he was walking that he was extremely upset. And when I saw, I looked in his eyes in fear, because it was easy not to be able to come home or be found in the woods or hung somewhere. So I was probably as afraid as any person could ever be. And he came up to me, and I want, I'm going to use this term just to express how things was, but I will say this before, using the word nigger is never acceptable 
except for an occasion like this to make a point. I don't believe that there's a good way that you can ever say one of the most devastating words. But his words to me was, he said, you know, Alan, he said, it ain't the niggas around here that's creating the problems. It's niggas like Martin Luther King that created the problems. And he expressed what all he would like to do if he had the opportunity to lynch him. The sad part about that was, number one, he felt so comfortable and to his right to be able to say to a little boy, a little black boy, to say nigger and to be called nigger. But even more sadder is that I was trained in order to live that that was perfectly okay. And I was so thankful that he wasn't about to lynch or take this problem out on me, which happens. There will be success stories, and the next thing you know, somebody's found in a creek or because some angry white man took the situation out on the one who was the closest to him that looked like the person who had committed the crime. This happened all the time. You could not resist the white man and survive it either through being cut off, lynched, isolated. So they had full control. Just imagine you have 14 children and the only way you can survive and feed them is to put up with whatever come your way. The one thing that I respect about my father in sharecropping, and let me just explain to you what sharecropping came in when slavery ended. And what the white man decided that we have all the property, we own it all. And black people cannot survive if they can't plant the cotton, if they can't plant the crops. So we will provide the land, the, the seed, and the materials. And they set up a system where you work 24, I mean, uh, seven days a week taking care of the animals, the crops. And when it came time to settle up with all this work, and no matter how many was in the family, instead of showing a profit, you were in more debt this year than you were last year. And the problem they would tell you is you can't leave and go to a factory job. You could, the, the whole idea, they were not gonna let companies come in because this country was built on free labor, at least in the southern state. Just think about, you have a business where you don't have to pay labor costs. So the richer got more richer and powerful, which was white, and blacks became more and more dependent. And you would see people that wanted to leave in the middle of the night, just throw up their hands and just leave because it was a hopeless um, situation. So. Thank you for that. I know some of these stories are a little difficult to hear, and we thank you for sharing that. Jerry, we hear so many times, um, at one time you were either the only African American or one of very few African Americans in Springboro, and your child was the only black child in the entire school system, but in reality, that really wasn't the first time in your life you found yourself. You already talked about when you left the military, but there was an experience where you were the only black in the entire country. Yeah. How did you, uh, going into those situations, unpack that a little bit for us. You went into these situations and kind of internally, how did you work yourself uh, to be comfortable with that environment? Hmm. This is... Right now. Hang on. This one is finished. Test the thing about that is this happened to me while I was still in the military. And some of you know that I spent 
spent some time uh, in the service, spent two, two tours in Vietnam, was wounded three times. But after that, after I got out of, out of Vietnam, I, I served some time in Okinawa, Guam, and the Philippines. And while I was in the Philippines, the Philippines was a great place because the, the Marines were the security for this Navy base that was right across the street from Manila. Not across the street, but across the bay uh, from Manila in, in the Philippines. And the Sangley Point uh, Naval Air Station uh, was there, and the Marines were the security. So when we got off duty, we'd go over to Manila and try and have a good time and just to see what's going on in Manila. And then we happened to go by the American Embassy in Manila. And the Marines were looking at them and were saying, geez, how do you get this job? I'd love to be a Marine security guard at an American Embassy. And I spent about a year and a half, almost a year and a half, in, in the Philippines. And then they gave me orders to go to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. And I said, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And so I came home on leave back in Cincinnati. And the thing that, that, that drove me to this was the fact that not wanting to go to Camp Lejeune and wanting to be a Marine security guard, I said, okay, how do I get that done? And back then, when we're talking about 1969, you could go out on the street and thumb a ride anywhere. And a lot of times, people will pick you up and take you wherever you needed to go, if, as long as it's in, in the trail. So I thumbed a ride from Cincinnati to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, had my uniform on, and I hitched a ride on an airport or Air Force uh, transport going up to Andrews. I got to Andrews Air Force Base, and I went in and got a taxi, and I went to headquarters Marine Corps, and I went in to see the commandant. I saw his adjutant, and I had my orders with him, with me. And I said, you know, I'm here because I want to request a change of duty station. And his adjutant looked at me, and he says, hey, you know what? We've never had anybody actually do this before, come up and request a change of duty station. A lot of people who don't want to go somewhere, especially in the military, when they, you, you've heard the term AWOL, well, they wouldn't show up. And I told him, I said, I just don't want to not show up for this, but I want to see if I can get, get a change. So I, he, he went in and he talked to the commandant. The commandant granted the, the, the request and said he was glad that I was able to do that. So I thumbed, I got back on the plane, came back to Cincinnati, you know, and, and um, uh, spent my time uh, at, at home on leave. Then I got a chance to go to Arlington, Virginia for Marine Security Guard training. And so one of the things that I wanted to do is I wanted to go back to the Philippines. Nice place. I spent a year plus over in the Philippines and had a lot of fun, worked hard, but had a lot of fun. But so I went through the training, and while we're doing the training, it's, it, it's like 12 weeks long, and you have to go through all of this stuff. And while, while you're going through the training, there are other units in, in Washington, D.C. that have trainees too, CIA agents, FBI. So when we would get out of class and go out and uh, have a drink or something like that, there was a place in Washington, D.C. called Rand's Club, and a lot of the diplomats hung out there. And so what we were not allowed to do is to tell people what we were doing and what we were about to embark upon, because that was the foreign service, that was your diplomats. And so we would just give up, you know, little bits of information while well, I'm here for training, and I, I met this guy at the bar, big tall guy, I, and, and I'm, I'm kidding you not, he, he was 7'2". He was seven foot two inches tall, and I'm sitting at the bar and I'm looking at him up, up like this, and I ask him, I said, so what do you do? He says, well, I'm a secretary. And I'm looking at him, I said, secretary, that's not what I think about when I see, hear somebody say secretary. So we go through all of this, and we, we met several times, so now we go through training, we get finished with the training, and now the assignments come out. And I'm thinking, okay, Manila. And 
I know a lot of us try to use reverse psychology in certain situations, so we had three choices of where we wanted to go once we got our assignments to go to embassy duty. And I put, the, uh, put Manila down last because I didn't want them to think I really wanted to go there, that they would give that to me. Well, long story short, I'm looking at the, the list that are posted on the wall out in the hall, and I'm seeing San Salvador, El Salvador. And I'm going, where is that? <laughs> Never heard of the place. Well, it's in Central America. Now, okay, so I didn't get the choice that I wanted, but I get assigned to San Salvador, El Salvador, and I'm thinking, okay, well, I'll, I'll make it work. Well, what happened was the guy that I was going to replace was there in Washington, D.C. And he was the sergeant, he was the NCOIC in charge of the American Embassy Security in San Salvador, El Salvador, Central America. And he found out that I had been assigned there. And he came up to me and he says, Sergeant Ferris? I said, yeah. He said, I see you're going to Salvador. I said, yeah. He said, well, I just left there. You're taking my place down there. I said, OK, tell me all about it. He says, you don't know? I said, no. He said, there aren't any black people in Salvador. There's not a black person that works in the embassy. But there were no African Americans in the entire country. And so he says, I, I don't understand why they're sending you there. So now I'm discouraged and I'm thinking, why do I want to go to San Salvador and, and have all of this problem being the only black uh, in, in a country? And so I went to my commanding officer in the training department and I said, look, I said, I was just told that there aren't any black people in, at the American Embassy and, and in Salvador. And I'm not sure that you got the right person. So what they did, they, they called me and said, well, we've been meaning to talk to you about that, Sergeant Ferris. And I said, well, yeah, when? Because I'm supposed to depart here in two days. So when were you going to tell me about it? So they told me, says, well, we've watched you throughout this entire training, and we liked how you interact with people. We like how you operate. We, we watch you work. And we think that you would be a great candidate to open up Central America uh, at the American Embassy in San Salvador. And I'm thinking, hmm. But they made me an offer. They said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to go spend six months. You'll send us a, repat a report back to headquarters every two weeks for six months. If at the end of six months you don't like it, you can't handle it, you let us know and we'll let you pick whatever duty station you want it. So in my mind, hey, I can do six months on my head in a, in a, in a phone booth without a dime because I wanted to go back to the Philippines. So with that being said, I get to San Salvador. I'm at the, Ameri at, at the uh, airport, and there, there's nobody there to pick me up. No Marines, nobody. Couldn't speak Spanish, had no idea where the embassy was or how I was going to get there. And what helped me was the fact that there was a gentleman I heard talking to a, a gentle, a, another guy in the airport. And he was speaking Spanish, but then he talked to somebody else in English. So I went to this guy that was speaking English. I said, look, I said, I need to get to the American Embassy, and I don't know how to get there. I can't speak Spanish. I don't, I don't know what's going on, but nobody's here to pick me up. So I need to get to the embassy. So he took me outside, got me a taxi, told him in Spanish, Spanish what, where he needed to take me. So I get to the embassy, and the Marines, except for one, I, I take that back, all the Marines but one were like totally disappointed that now they have a, a black commander that's going to take over the embassy and the security end. And I said, you know, guys, I said, you know, when we were in combat, and some of these guys were, got the embassy duty, and they weren't ever in combat. But the thing was is that there was two of them that were. And I said, when we're in combat, you didn't worry about me being black. As a matter of fact, you needed it. We needed each other. So long story short, we get into the embassy situation. I make some changes. I transfer a couple guys out to Guam and Okinawa, and I get 
uh, another, uh, I, I get another guy that, that came down there from uh, Puerto Rican. And so I ended up staying there. And when the, finally the, the ambassador, I, I, I didn't tell you the part where the ambassador wasn't even there when I got there. He was coming in, he was out of, out of the country uh, doing, doing some other work and coming back. So when he got back, we got word that he was coming back. So I got all the Marines together. We got on dress blues, going to welcome the ambassador back to, uh, uh, to the country. And so he gets in, he, his entourage comes in, the car's parked, he comes around the corner. And I snapped everybody to his attention and present arms. And as I'm standing there with, with this salute, the shadow comes over me and I hear this, Jerry? And I look and I go up, I'm going, Bill? The guy that I met, at the bar, the seven foot two guy is the ambassador for San Salvador, El Salvador. So he, when we rendered the salute, he says, Jerry, come go with me. He got me on the elevator and he told me a lot of things that were going on, why he was out of the country. You had to have a top secret clearance for all of this stuff. So the thing was is yes, I was the only African American at the American Embassy in San Salvador, El Salvador. I also was the only African American that was in the entire country. And so as I would go out into the country, in, in, in the countryside, and talk to the locals, they saw me and they saw my dark skin, and the kids nicknamed me Pele. And so if you know who Pele is, the Brazilian soccer player, that was my nickname. So anytime I was in town or outside the embassy, I was Pele. And I had a great time in Salvador. Yo puedo hablar español ahora, pero back then, not a word. So I learned how to speak Spanish, and I loved that time. I spent the entire time in San Salvador. Thanks for that. Um, Terry, uh, we, we already heard R.D. and uh, Reverend Foster for a little bit talk about the importance of the father in how you approach life as an African-American going through it. Eleven, one of eleven kids. Talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> Again, um, not only was I one of eleven kids, I was also a twin. Um, unfortunately, we were in an environment to where education wasn't really expressed. Um, I became an athlete because I wanted a pair of Chuck Taylor Converse's and at that time they cost twelve ninety nine, but there were so many kids that we couldn't, I knew my parents couldn't afford it so the schools during that time would buy you shoes if you played ball and so I began to play ball and as a result of the ability that the Lord had given me, unbeknownst to me Others began to take me, grown-ups began to take me under their wings and just give me little tidbits of survival, kinds of inspiration. Uh, the coach would call to make sure that I was at home. Uh, my twin brother, who had had a medical problem, he did gerrymandering. We were uh, gerrymandering, which many of you are aware of. My twin brother went to the junior high school that was in the inner city and I went to the um, junior high school where the, the, the white people were. And there were quite, there were some of us. It, it wasn't a whole bunch. And during this time, myself, I was re, uh, born in 53. So we're coming up during the heat of the uh, civil rights. I mean, I remember Al Shadokati. I remember all of the news. I, the captions, my parents not able to explain to me as a little kid what was going on. I'm seeing the German shepherds and the bull horns. Uh, even in our community, on Sundays, we didn't go, well, it was uptown. We didn't go uptown because the Klan would have their rally, uh, rallies every Sunday. And so we could hear them on the bull horns. We, I wasn't far from, from downtown. And so it was a, uh, the coaches, I can remember the coaches telling us, 
Okay, now you can have camaraderie here, but once you leave practice or away from here, no camaraderie. Don't call none of these guys. I don't even want you <clears throat> don't uh, talk to any of the girls. As a matter of fact, many of the good athletes, the better athletes, maybe the best athletes, did not play ball. And the reason they didn't is because they were either attracted to white girls or white girls were attracted to them or they smoke cigarettes. And so therefore, a lot of them did not um, play sports. And I can remember the coach, again, uh, he would tell us, you know, as long as you're here, this is what we're doing, but when you're out there, you see what I'm saying, I don't want you having any parts. And so what that was like, it was a, I didn't realize it at the time, but it, it, it's kind of a schizophrenic existence. Uh, these guys are in school, they're, they're giving me money, uh, they're buying my lunch because I'm making points. But when we would hear something on the news or there was <clears throat> some uproar, then they would have to take, the uh, teachers would have to take and put us close in a room because all of the white students with their swastikas and, you know, black this, black that, <clears throat> were going to jump on us. I can also remember we would um, have to run from that school after practice. We would have to run home. And the reason we ran home is because they knew what time we would get out of practice. And on the way home, they would be driving by and it was, hey, nigger this, hey, nigger that. Or they would throw beer bottles out. I mean, it was, it was just life. It wasn't pleasant, but that's what it was like growing up. And then being able to come home, uh, my father again, I never recall my father ever missing a day at work. But the type of work that he did was, he said was a heart carrier uh, for people that would build buildings. My father carried the bricks. And of course, he would have to carry the bricks to the side, and sometimes he would have to carry them up the ladders. But he was always the low person on the totem pole. I can remember him coming home the times his hands was kind of frozen in a certain position, and he would just run them under the uh, hot water trying to get them so they could move again. But by the time we woke up, he was gone. Um, Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, it was, it, it, it was um, a type of existence where I knew that this wasn't what I wanted to do or what I wanted to be. I, I, there was always something within me that, that, that let me know that this wasn't who I was. Um, even on campus, uh, I, I was kind of set apart because I didn't want to do what everyone else was doing. I knew that I had a mind, and once I began to even work in the Department of Pharmacology, I bought medical books and medical charts because I would be intellectually insulted by so many because, again, I'm a young guy on campus uh, that's working in the field where there's no black, so there was few because they were medical students. And so they were catching their own crap because they were either from another country. I met uh, a lot of blacks and people of color from other countries that would go to their house at university to go through medical school. But of course, the medical school was dominated by the, the, the white males, um, and therefore everyone had to go through the, the well, we call it a kiss in the ring and, and that type of stuff. And so therefore, it was, wasn't much camaraderie but I knew that what was within me was greater than what they were seeing. Um, I was raised uh, with a sir and ma'am. We would say that, and I still say it to this day, sir and ma'am. I remember one of the um, uh, professors asking me, pulled me to the side, and he was wanting to know if I was from the south. I said, well, south of here, Hamilton, Ohio. I said, why? He said, because of the sir and ma'am. I say, well, this is the way I was raised. There were other and, and many opportunities to be able to make a contribution because I learned three L's at a very early age. That was look, listen, and learn. And since I was invisible anyway, the thing that I would do is I would look, listen, and learn. Whatever someone was, was doing be around me, I would inquire as to what they were doing, how to do it. And if they weren't there, then, hey, I can do that.
And so this was one of the ways that I was able to achieve and make some of the contributions that I was able to make. Uh, the one thing that I can remember I would have to got to the point to where I would talk to drug reps, your Pfizer's, Hoffman, LaRoche, Burroughs, welcome, when they would come in and I had achieved at, at an early age being able to sit in with these discussions because I was responsible for making the budget. And so I would have to go through stacks of paper to determine how much we in the department, how much it would cost for each of the items for however many volunteers we had. But still, <laughs> I was making peanuts. I remember one of the professors telling me, he said, you know, let's just face it, you're just a high paid gopher. Well, as a young man, I was. And the thing about being a high paid gopher is that it allowed me to buy a home, it allowed me to buy a car, um, I reduced my student hours because I was having and learning more doing this than I was and going to school trying to get a degree. And so <clears throat> I um, have always, for some reason the Lord has, has placed me around people with exceptional minds but I always knew within myself that mine was just as good as theirs. I, we would have race conversations where they would bring it up. And I learned at a very early age as a, as a means of survival, when you show me or tell me the one person that knew what color they were going to be born, what family they were going to be born into, what geographical location they were going to be born into, when you told me or showed me that person, then we could have a discussion about my pigmentation, meaning that I was inferior. And so um, it hurt me in some times and in some ways, but it helped me to maintain a sense of significance, a sense of pride, a sense of dignity. And I've tried to pass it on with my kids and to my kids. Thank you for that. R.D., um, you're younger significantly than the rest of us. And I can't help but think there's got to be a little bit of frustration in someone your age that um, here 20, 30 years later when you came along, we still hadn't resolved some of these problems. And in our conversation earlier, you made a comment that really stuck with me, and I think you attributed it to your father about life is not fair, life was meant to be lived. And can you explain why you can still have that attitude when it would seem so natural to be frustrated that some of the issues that these gentlemen are talking about that were 20, 25 years before you were born, but you still are able to adopt a positive attitude of life is not fair, life was meant to be lived? Well, I don't... I wouldn't necessarily say that that discounts the frustration because it it still is extremely frustrated frustrating that the things that that we still have to experience to this day and I think we would all know that Wounds hurt, but in order for a wound to heal, it needs to be exposed. So if we keep things covered up, they'll never heal. heal. So I think things need to be brought to the surface and need to be brought to the light in order to come up with some sort of solution and get some forward progress in this matter. And hmm. <laughs> Chiefs, to be honest with you, it is it's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, well, it, we're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
we're uh, approaching 90 minutes in, and that was kind of the time frame that we had established. And I, again, want to thank uh, Southwest Church and thank Maureen in the back for setting up this, making the logistics of this so easy. I want to thank you. We had some questions that we didn't get to today. But I received a letter earlier this week. I didn't get the permission of the person who sent it to me, an African-American friend of mine, when he uh, about this event. And I'd, I'd like to, to read a paragraph from the letter he sent me. He said, I want to say that yesterday is gone. We are to live in the now with the hope that tomorrow will be better. For we cannot live in the yesterdays and we cannot live in the tomorrows. My message is that today we must come to an understanding to one, love another, two, understand one another, and most of all, three, respect one another. That is the great beginning to change the way of the world. The Bible teaches us that everyone is not going to be happy about change and our friends might even try to attempt to discourage us. My mission is to hear at least one person say, I want to have a relationship of love with my fellow man, regardless of race or gender. With that said, my mission is accomplished. Would you please join me in giving these four gentlemen a good round of applause. Thank you. I know some of you may have questions. I've encouraged the panel to stay here as long as they can if you want to talk individually with them. Uh, it's hard to put yourself out there to talk about your life sometimes. And uh, I appreciate everyone from the, the folks who are watching on Facebook Live to you coming out on a cold day on a Friday night when there's probably a hundred other things to do uh, to just listen. And uh, thank you again so much on behalf of the City of Springboro and the Division of Police. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.